uh, or 50 odd uh, people line up uh, or sign up for the uh, web this morning's this afternoon's webinar. We'll just wait one minute. Uh, when you come on, you're automatically on mute. Um, so if you do want to say something, take yourself off mute. Um, otherwise, uh, you can type uh, messages to everyone. Uh, there you can rate Jason's pre uh, uh, presentation as you go, like the worm in the election uh, <laughs> debate, if you wish. Uh, that you, you're welcome to. Um, uh, but we'll uh, we'll just wait a minute for a, a few more to get on because there has been uh, a couple of people just checking the links and not realising they didn't have it or what have you. Uh, so Jordan's just looking after them in the other room. You didn't tell me about this live rating system, Tony. I've only just made it up. <laughs> No pressure. I'm going to have quite a bit of fun with it myself through. Uh, uh, I had already turned my bullshit detector off, um, yeah. which I do, I do with any any of the lawyers, uh, just so it didn't disturb us through today's proceedings. All right, well, let's get started. Um, welcome to today's webinar, um, Top Tips for Establishing CRCP, CRC Projects. Uh, use of partner agreement template. Um, I'm Tony Peacock. I'm the CEO of the Cooperative Research Centres Association and we're uh, grateful for your uh, joining us today. Um, Jason's going to go through a PowerPoint presentation for around about 30 minutes uh, and then we'll take questions after that. You can type your questions into um, the chat area so that we can uh, have them lined up uh, ready to go as soon as he's finished uh, speaking. Uh, if you want to ask them directly, just be aware that you're all currently on mute. Um, that's just so that if somebody um, uh, is typing away or whatever with 50, up, uh, 50 people online, we want to uh, keep it quiet during uh, Jason's presentation. Um, we are taping. Uh, we will record today's presentation uh, and question time. So if you've got a concern about that, um, just be aware that we are recording. Also, uh, so obviously don't uh, give us specific information or ask questions about anything that's commercial in confidence. Um, now, I asked Jason to do this presentation specifically because we've heard of it a few niggling issues around the CRC project agreements. Uh, the, the purpose today is to help you think about all the possible or some of the possible issues and resolve them before you apply for the Commonwealth money. Once you are successful uh, in your bid for a CRCP, the Commonwealth asks that you get your uh, agreements in place within 30 days. So the, the the clock starts going, and that's certainly not the time that you want to be dealing with how you're going to run the project or who's going to own the intellectual property. Uh, so we strongly encourage people um, uh, to think about these things, and Jason will raise many of them uh, be, uh, during the course of his presentation. The Commonwealth Agreement uh, online is, is a very basic one. Uh, and doesn't cover all the issues that uh, we've heard of coming up through, and nor would you expect it to, um, because um, it's it's the base model, if you like. So Elementary Law is a, a very young company in Melbourne, but Jason uh, Watson is a highly experienced lawyer working with CRCs. He's uh, listed as a major player with a significant reputation uh, by intellectual asset management. And Doyle's lists him as a leading Victorian non-contentious IP lawyer, which I love that title, uh, Jason. He's also doing some of this stuff himself, not just advising others, because he's the chairman of Exo Farm, which just listed at uh, 20 cents in December. And as I checked just before we came on, sitting at 49 cents today. So one touch wood, one of um, the more successful IPOs of recent times on the ASX. So congratulations on that, uh, Jason, and we will hand over to you to take us through top tips for establishing a CRCP. We will finish at 2, two Eastern, um, 
we'll try and honour that time to keep it to an hour. Over to you, Jason. Thank you, Tony. Always, always good to put a, a time restriction on your lawyers talking. Um, thank you for that introduction and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this is my very first webinar, so um, uh, apologies to those that logged in early and uh, saw us working through the technology, um, but thank you for joining. So I'll take my video off on a sec so you can just focus on the slides, uh, but today essentially we're focusing on the top tips for CRCs in particular related to establishing the partner agreement and focusing on the um, template that the Commonwealth has kindly provided. Um, just briefly, the blurb, uh, elementary law, as Tony mentioned, we do a lot of work, work for CRCs um, and also for CRCPs, and we, we tend for CRCs and CRCPs to work on a um, fixed fee type model, so um, on a no surprise basis. So. That's, that's the quick blurb, and now I'll just um, take myself off and jump in to the slides. Hopefully you can all still hear me. Um, so firstly, in terms of a summary of the presentation today, um, essentially I'm just going to run through the chronology of uh, the process of establishing a CRCP, um, but mostly because on once you hear about the success of the application, what you do from there. In relation to the terminology that I'll be using, it's largely derived from the Commonwealth terminology under the Commonwealth guidelines, the, the guidelines which are updated from time to time relating to CRCPs. Um, the grant being the form of grant agreement that the Commonwealth asks the lead participant to enter into. Um, and that's available online. Uh, the grantee or the lead being the, that, the industry entity that uh, will enter into the grant with the Commonwealth and that will manage the project. Uh, the partners are all of the parties to the project and they're either industry entities being SMEs or larger entities and research organisations, uh, commonly universities, uh, CSIRO, um, some state or Commonwealth departments or hospitals. Uh, the partner agreement is the terminology the Commonwealth uses for the agreement between the different parties in the research project. And then we have intellectual property related terminology. Um, so the Commonwealth refers to existing material, which commonly we refer to as background IP. Uh, activity material, we also refer to as project IP being intellectual property created in the project. Uh, reporting material is the reports provided to the Commonwealth. And then the, uh, just for completeness, the definition of material there is, uh, is quite broad. So um, to jump into it, uh, firstly, this is pre-submission when you're having discussions between the different parties. Uh, firstly, you might consider whether you need a confidential disclosure agreement for those discussions. If it's a, um, a piece of research that's quite confidential and you're sharing information, then you may wish to put a template in place from the very beginning. Um, from there, I've mentioned the participant declaration. I'm, I'm skipping a lot here in terms of the, the body of work that goes to pulling a proposal together. Uh, so that's a, that's a separate body of work. Once you get to that stage, then each participant will need to sign a declaration and file that with the Commonwealth, and that's based on a standard template. Um, in that, each partner declares that they will comply with the guidelines and the grant requirements um, and support and participate in the project as specified in the application. And that is, of course, presuming that it's successful in attracting Commonwealth funding. The, the reason I mention the participant declaration is that it's a good opportunity to ensure that everyone is on the same page in terms of the proposal and the research that will be undertaken and that everyone understands all of the requirements involved. In particular, at this time, it would be a good opportunity to share both the guidelines and the Commonwealth Grant Agreement um, with the other partners at this stage and ensure that they're familiar with these and they agree to comply with, with all of the terms. So that's, that's to avoid any surprises down the track. 
There's also the option of the early stage of establishing a term sheet. Um, and that's really a non-binding indication of the key commercial parameters of the project. Uh, for example, relating to the ownership of intellectual property um, and any other circumstances relating to, to the project. It's, it's, it's essentially a judgment call as to whether a term sheet is required with, with only a few parties involved. It may not be necessary and the projects and the rights may be relatively apparent. If, however, there are quite a few partners involved, then a term sheet could be a useful summary of the intentions of everyone um, should the project be successful. Tip two is the grant agreement and the Commonwealth grant agreement. So it's, it's actually the grant agreement that you have 30 days to sign once you're notified of success. Um, the partners agreement itself, there's no specified timeline, but it has to of course be achieved before um, the project commences and the parties are involved. So in terms of the grant template, it's essentially a Commonwealth boilerplate terms Hopefully it's been reviewed prior to submission and um, there shouldn't be any specific issues, but a number of items to consider and check at this stage are in relation to the quantum of grant funding, uh, whether it is the same amount as requested, um, whether it's a lesser amount, it's a, I, I can ensure it won't be a greater amount, but if it's a lesser amount, you need to think about the milestones and the deliverables under the project and if they can still be achieved. If, if the funding impacts upon achievement of those, then you might need to go back to the Commonwealth and negotiate around those. Um, so yeah, any impact of funding on delivery, etc. Are all of the specific details correct in terms of the parties' names and addresses, contact details? Um, and in the schedules are the milestones and deliverables all correct. Um, any changes in circumstances since the submission? For example, a, a partner may have indicated that they want to pull out or um, there may have been another development that impacts upon the project. So if anything has arisen in the meantime, now's the opportunity to have a discussion with the Commonwealth around that. Um, my experience has been that the Commonwealth is relatively flexible at this stage, so it, it's useful to raise any issues like that at an early stage. Um, the Commonwealth does reserve the right to change and update its grant template, so you may want to do a comparison of the, the final version you receive in, in comparison to the template that's online um, and be aware of any changes that have occurred. Um, and then any other special project circumstances. So um, there might, if, if for example, the, the insurance position isn't well suited to a specific party or, or any other issue that's arisen, uh, now's an opportunity to discuss that. The one issue I've presented there is um, Somewhat oddly, in my view, the, the Commonwealth grant uh, talks about personal information not being transferred outside of Australia. Um, that's, that may be a restriction for some projects. Um, if, if it is, uh, you could consider whether that's actually an activity under this project or whether you, you remove it as a separate separate activity outside the scope of the, the project, so that limitation won't apply. Um, otherwise, as expressed in the current Commonwealth Grant, you're not permitted to send any personal information arising from the project outside of Australia. So that's just one, one anomaly to, to consider. Um, of course, you might, you should probably consider that upfront when you're um, submitting the application. The, so moving on, uh, if you've submitted the application, you've been notified of success, you've signed the grant agreement. Generally, you'd, the lead participant would, as long as there's no new issues, the lead participant should have sufficient certainty to sign the grant agreement themselves. 
um, without consulting with the other parties in any great detail because they should already be across all of the details. If, of course, funding or the role of the various parties has changed, then, then you might need to tic-tac with them and have discussions on that. Um, but once you get, once you've signed the Commonwealth Grant Agreement, you can then think about what's called the, the Partner Agreement. Um, and here you have a number of options. Um, you can have one agreement or you may wish to split into multiple agreements. So you might want to take a, a divide and conquer approach rather than negotiating with multiple parties. Um, if, if, for example, a project only has three parties involved, then it would seem fairly normal and common to, to just enter into one agreement between those three parties. If, however, there's, say, five, ten different parties involved, then it may make sense to separate the negotiations into different agreements. Uh, that way you can customise clauses to the specific parties and you can customise the approach to the different parties. That, whether that approach is successful or not really depends on the level of interaction and the rights as between the different par parties. Um, if all of the, the partners need to interact with each other and exchange information, um, produce deliverables which another party can work on, then it may make sense for there to still be a single, single partner agreement. Or you might wish to break it up into different streams. If there are different streams of activities, you, you might have one partner agreement with parties A, B and C who are working on stream one and uh, you might have a second partner agreement with parties D, F and G uh, who are working on stream two. So th there's a number of different ways that you, um, you can approach it. And really that all just depends on how you think negotiations will proceed and um, whether it makes sense to divide the parties out into separate agreements. Now just just a quick note on terminology. Um, the Commonwealth seems to like use of the words partner. Uh, they, li they like to have everyone feeling good and hugging each other. So it's called a, it's called a partner's agreement, but um, I'd recommend that you insert a clause into the agreement clarifying that you, it's not a legal partnership. Um, and that can go in what's called the relationship clause that explains that the parties are simply contractors and not, not employees or, or partners um, or joint venturers with each other. Um, you could even, if you wish, look to change it from partners agreement to participants agreement or, or refer to parties or other short form names because lawyers at times can, can become a little bit hung up on the use of the word partners in, in implying a, a legal partnership for profit, which, which is not the case here. Well, it could be if you wish, but generally for a project um, such as this, that's, that's not the case. Bear in mind also that under the Commonwealth Guidelines and Grant, um, you can also subcontract work. Um, so there might be some analysis work or uh, some other work to be undertaken that uh, you wish to simply have in a contracting relationship so those parties would not necessarily be partners within the project per se. Um, they may simply be sub subcontractors. So the lead would subcontract the work to those parties. Um, it gives you a great bit more flexibility in terms of how you structure your subcontracting relationship. Uh, you do, however, need to ensure that it fits with the requirements in the guidelines in particular around expenditure and ensuring that if you want to spend part of the Commonwealth grant funds on, on contracting, um, that you have the correct expenditure arrangements in place around invoicing, record keeping, etc. cetera. Um, the guidelines are quite clear in relation to what's required in, in that regard. Moving on, um, the Commonwealth grant has 
what's called flow down clauses. And these are mandatory Commonwealth terms um, that must also apply to all of the partners in the project. So it's the responsibility of the lead to ensure that these flow down to all of the partners in the project. And the way you do that is through reference in the partnership agreement. There's a number of, um, there is a number of requirements from the grant um, that each partner agrees to undertake the project as per the dates, milestones and requirements specified. Um, comply with those clauses that are specifically identified and I've given some, there's about 10 or so of them, 10 or more. Um, some examples of those are clauses relating to fraud, privacy, and the one that the Commonwealth seems to love is that uh, each party will comply with all applicable laws, um, which being laws that apply, they apply anyway, but uh, the Commonwealth likes to say that. Um, the other the other requirement is that uh, clauses which are expressed to survive termination of the grant agreement will also survive through the partners agreement. Um, now, the requirement to flow these down is is the it's the norm that they're required to flow down, um, except uh, where due to the context it is not relevant to do so. So. Um, if, for example, a party was not receiving any personal information or private information, um, uh, privacy requirements may not apply. So that's, that's just one example. Um, my recommendation there would be to ensure that the, if, if the exception is to apply, that it's clearly documented as to why that requirement wasn't flowed down. That way, if the Commonwealth ever asks down the track, then uh, there's a clear explanation that's available. And you could, by all means, just uh, document that within the partner agreement itself. In, in terms of the approach to these mandatory flow down requirements, there's a number of different ways you can do it. Um, you could simply incorporate the Commonwealth grant by cross-reference. So, um, cross-reference the title and date of signing of the grant and um, uh, each partner would agree to comply with the the clauses as relevant to them. Uh, if you do that, then generally you'd want to attach the grant as a schedule to the agreement and commonly you'd, you'd do that anyway. Um, if you take that approach, one item you'd want to think about, in, in certainly the parties that aren't the lead, might be a restriction on the lead's ability to amend the grant um, because otherwise the amendments could occur and they could apply to the partners um, without their approval. So that's something to bear in mind. Um, another approach would be to, to copy and paste the applicable grant clauses. Um, so you could do that within the body of the contract or, or the schedule. And um, related to that, you could also edit the grant clauses. So some of the grant clauses you might wish to ensure also apply not only uh, as the responsibility to the Commonwealth, but also as between the various partners in the project. So um, obligations such as confidentiality to each other, reporting to each other, um, publication procedure, etc. cetera. Uh, those are fairly standard terms that you would find in a, in a partner agreement. So elements of that can flow from the grant agreement into the partner agreement itself. The next key item, five, perhaps it should be tip one, I've just called show me the money. And this relates to uh, the funding and the funds as between the partners themselves. So the Commonwealth template, as, as Tony mentioned, um, it's, a, it's a starting point template. It's, it's, it's quite good for small projects and um, for fairly, fairly direct projects, but um, there are a number of elements that can be added to it. And in terms of the, the funding and the in-kind contributions, um, there, it's not that those mechanisms can be expanded further. Um, 
So you might want to detail uh, the payments from the lead to the others. So I would generally recommend that you add a clause to say that payments from the lead are subject to receipt of the Commonwealth funds. Uh, the reason for this is the Commonwealth reserves a number of rights uh, to withhold funds and they include reasons relating to um, fault or default of, the, of any of the partners, but they also include reasons relating to the um, Commonwealth policy and um, Commonwealth funding and procurement. So um, you could, if the, if the lead doesn't include such a clause, it could find itself in a situation whereby it's obliged, contractually obliged to make payments to the partners, yet the Commonwealth may have withheld funds due to a reason that wasn't the lead's fault. So um, the lead want, should ensure that it doesn't end up in, in that position. Um, you should also de detail the provision of contributions and the related to that, the delivery of milestones. And for all of those, I'd generally recommend that um, you work on a funding schedule uh, that details what the funding is, how it's split, and when when it's going to be paid. Um, so as to the when it's going to be paid, the, it should be relatively frequent. Um, there may be some payment upfront as a, as a sign of good faith. Um, I would generally recommend that any upfront payments are relatively low, uh, depending on the project circumstances and what um, upfront investments might be required. Thereafter, um, quarterly payments um, are fairly common in project agreements, but it, it could be different. It could be purely based on dates and milestones. Um, generally, I recommend that payments are tied to milestones so that if a milestone is not achieved, you can actually withhold payment until the milestone and the related report is provided. Other items to consider in relation to funding are clawback rights. So uh, the Commonwealth grant has a number of terms upon which the Commonwealth can clawback fund funds or um, or minimise funding. So you want to make sure that if if that applies, that the lead partner is also able to apply that to to the other partners, so that um, it's not stuck. Um, having to pay money that it hasn't received itself. Um, some other basic notes here, just to be aware that the Commonwealth grant funding is treated as taxable income, unless you're uh, specifically a tax exempt entity. Um, so you also want to think about that in terms of the timing of payments. You, you don't want to receive a, a, a significant Commonwealth payment in one financial year and have that taxable, yet the next financial year um, have all of your expenditure. So that's just one to, to be wary about. Um, R&D tax incentive, uh, you can include special clauses around that as well in terms of each party assisting each other to make uh, R&D tax incentive claims. And you, there are some um, clauses in there relating to record keeping, auditing and access, but they can be expanded further if you like, such as by including reference to specific accounting standards and uh, detailing when, when audit um, requirements might apply and when access to records may be required. The tip six, um, really relates to the people governance and management of the project. The, the template is very scant on this. Um, there, there's no specific uh, model provided and there's no clauses really relating to it. Partly that's because each, each project might be a little bit different and some of these items may not apply. So questions to ask yourself is, are there key personnel involved in the project? And essentially that's anyone, if, if they left um, whoever's employing them, if, if they weren't available, would, would the project go ahead or would the project fail? So if the lead 
partner is um, reliant upon a, um, a university staff member, um, they may wish to specifically name that staff member within the grant, generally within the schedule to the grant, and um, ensure that the provision of funding and the continuance of um, the partnership is subject to the availability of that person. Or if they're not available, then um, there are some fairly standard clauses we can use relating to replacement of key personnel. So, and, and that applies, I've, I've singled out universities there, but that also applies to other, um, other partners in the project. If, if there are key, key nominated people, um, then you may also wish to take that approach. Um, the next item to consider is students and universities will want to ensure that if, if students are to be engaged in the project, then um, there are some fairly standard clauses um, which any university will be able to um, supply uh, relating to student engagement. And those clauses relate to things like the ongoing supervision of the student, um, ownership of any intellectual property generated by the student, the students write in their own thesis, presuming they're a PhD student, and the right for that to be examined, and also confidentiality and publication. So if there are students involved, then that's um, a clause that should be added. In relation to governance and manage management, um, some projects, uh, so smaller projects in particular, can may be able to be managed on a day-to-day, month-to-month um, ongoing basis simply by phone calls, emails and, and contacts between parties. Um, but the Commonwealth guidelines do specifically talk about governance and um, state that a, a good governance model is to be implemented uh, for the project. So you should think about what are the needs of the project and what structure will meet those. So one, one approach would be to have a project committee and you might have a one nominee from each, each partner on the committee. It might meet on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis just to run through where the project's at, what are the ongoing um, developments, what's coming up next and whether any issues have arisen. So um, a committee like that is one, one uh, management tool that could be used. There are, of course, numerous others that could be used uh, if needed. Tip seven, um, this is really the, the who, what, when, and as a lawyer, we, we often assist um, parties in, in putting in place project agreements, but then something goes wrong and um, at times it might be the lawyer's fault, at times it's, the parties haven't really turned their mind to milestones and reporting and dates. So um, a little bit too often we might see that there's a, there's a broad project plan that, that says what the party is going to do. But uh, so that may be the application that's, that's made to the Commonwealth, but it doesn't get into the nitty gritty. So um, it may broadly say, we are going to do X, Y, Z, but um, we may be five or diff six different partners, for example. Um, what you need to do is specifically break it down and say, out of all of the partners, who's going to do what? When are they going to do it by? And what are they going to deliver to show that they've achieved that? So you can insert a, a milestone schedule, milestone and reporting schedule, and it can be as simple as a table um, with one column having the activities, another column having the parties responsible and the, um, the third column having the, the delivery date as well as the, um, the demonstration of how that's delivered. So that's, that's where I would recommend just focusing and putting some more details in. Um, to ensure that it's crystal clear as to what everybody will be doing. From there, it's, um, it's also important that you diarise those milestones and um, that each partner should, if there's an issue that arises, it might not be a partner's fault, but if there's an issue that arises, they should provide advance notice of any possible delays 
as well as workarounds and, and how to fix those. Um, and of course, the lead should ensure that it's very diligent in um, chasing up uh, the partners if, if something isn't delivered as and when it's due and taking action in relation to that. Just the final bullet there is to say that the lead should also um, be transparent with the other partners. Um, so if a report submitted to the Commonwealth, then generally um, I would expect that the part, all partners should receive a copy of that report. Um, unless, of course, it's dealing with a specific issue relating to a specific partner, but um, transparency around the, the projects and reporting um, um, is standard good governance. Um, further clauses to be considered is a clause around publications and publicity. Um, so inserting a publication procedure. Normally any party wanting to undertake a publication would submit it to the lead and possibly the other partners for review within commonly it's a period of around 30 days and feedback and um, after the feedback's provided, either the publication's reviewed or it can be, if approved, it can be submitted in the form um, um, approved. There's also a need for um, details around publicity. So who's responsible for publicity, whether that's the lead, um, presumably it would be. Um, universities as well have, and other institutes have, um, uh, marketing department, so they may wish to um, undertake some publicity themselves. Uh, what What is the publicity approval process should be considered, as well as the Commonwealth um, requirements. So the, the grant's fairly explicit in saying that there should be no announcement regarding an award of the grant, even on social media without Commonwealth permission. So, um, so once you find out about the grant, um, just make sure that your social media person doesn't turn around and uh, send out a tweet announcing the details um, unless the Commonwealth has approved. Uh, the Commonwealth must be attributed and um, if there are to be specific events, then an opportunity for the Minister to attend is required as well. Tip nine, and I, I, it's a bit like the iceberg. I, I've held off on the, um, the bigger issues till the end. Uh, this, this slide, and, and I've also done the lawyer thing, and I've split my 10 tips into tip 9.1, and the following we will have tip 9.2. This slide should be relatively non-contentious, um, but the, the, um, the template partner agreement doesn't go into much detail relating to intellectual property uh, and that's because it's up to the partners to determine their position. Um, but in terms of background intellectual property, so that's anything a party brings to the project. So it's either pre-existing or they create it outside of the scope of the project and wish to contribute it to the project. Uh, so generally, you'd take a standard form approach of uh, requiring a license for use in the project. Um, Commonly, no warranties are provided around the use of background IP. Consider whether there's any likelihood of improvements to background IP being made, and, and if so, who they should be owned by. Uh, an example, if, if for example, a, a university was providing uh, teaching materials and another party was to, to add to those materials, then perhaps so should be uh, vested in the university if it's the delivery of a specific program or if uh, if there's a patented technology and an improvement might fall within the scope of the patent then uh, perhaps that improvement might be owned by the owner of that patent. Also consider whether it's likely that background IP might be needed for commercialization and if so upon what terms uh, you can either be you can, there, there's a few approaches you can take. You can simply um, take the view that no, we're creating new materials, new IP, uh, background IP is unlikely to be relevant, in which case the, the issue doesn't need to be addressed. Um, 
Alternatively, you could say that each party will reasonably negotiate a license to background IP if, if it's needed for commercialization, um, including returns related to that. Or you could be even more specific and outline the specific terms of, of what the license would be. So that would in, could include things like royalties, territory, etc. Um, the other thing to consider about background IP is whether it will be reported to the Commonwealth, uh, because if it's reported to the Commonwealth, then it falls within reporting materials and it's therefore licensed to the Commonwealth. My view would generally be that you're not, most projects do not um, report the specific details of background IP to the Commonwealth, so um, that may not be relevant, but, but if it is, it just needs to be considered in the, in the context of the scope of the licence to the Commonwealth and ensuring that those rights flow through. And they're, they're reasonable. I, I view them as generally reasonable rights. The Commonwealth has the rights to use it for its, for its own purposes, but they exclude uh, commercial application and licensing. So that's the, that's on the, that covers the report IP as well. So um, the license that flows through to the Commonwealth. The next, the next big one, and sorry, this is a fairly busy slide, um, but the next big one is around intellectual property that's developed in the course of the project. So um, we'll refer to this as project IP, or you might see it otherwise referred to as activity material. So um, I've just broken down a number of items to be considered. The first being use rights. Um, what, what rights does each party have to use project IP? Generally, they'd have the use to use it for the uh, use in the project and for the project. Um, they might also have internal ongoing use rights. So um, if it was a research institute, that research institute may want to use the, the project IP internally um, for ongoing experiments or for purposes relating to commercialize, uh, sorry, not towards commercialization, um, uh, towards um, future developments and publications. So uh, generally, if it was internal use rights, then it would exclude commercial commercialization rights. And also consider who else might need rights to use and what rights might be required. That'll really depend on who the, the partners are and what their interest in the project is. So in terms of ownership, um, I think in the blurb that we put out, we kind of said that um, the CRC projects flip uh, the standard funding model on its head. And that was in reference to the ARC, Australian Research Council linkage agreement, whereby um, the funding flows through the university. And in that context, the university um, is very willing generally to, to claim ownership of the funding and claim ownership of um, intellectual property that arises through that. Uh, CRCP flips that model in a sense because the funding flows through uh, the grantee. So the company who receives the, um, the funding from the Commonwealth and um, the Commonwealth terms don't mandate a model, but they are fairly pro company ownership. And I say that because uh, there's a clause 17.1 I've, I've said from the grant that says that the grantee will own the intellectual property rights in, in project material, um, but that is subject to the relevant partner agreement. So you can, of course, agree a different model. Um, the one, an aspect to consider is what best achieves the Commonwealth objectives. So the Commonwealth objectives are around improving the competitiveness competitiveness, productivity and sustainability of Australian industries, encouraging and facilitating SME participation, and that the industry entity should be capable of commercialization, commercializing the research. So my reading of this is that it's fairly pro ownership um, by either the grantee or the, um, the other industry partners involved. Um, but consider what makes sense in the, in the context. If, for example, a university or research institute was contributing significant background IP 
or if there was a module of the project that related to developing teaching materials or presenting something, then it may well make sense for the university to own that aspect or that module. So you can also divide ownership um, based upon different types of intellectual property and um, provided that it's not the same IP, so you can't readily split that, but um, if, if it's different types of IP, you could split that into different areas and, and different owners. Um, joint IP can be messy. So I've made that comment because common joint, joint IP can also work, but most commonly what we see is that um, joint IP is the lazy way out that uh, it, it gives the parties a, a bit of a feel good sensation in that they're, they're entering into the project and owning things jointly. But then what they commonly fail to do is get into the detail as to, to what joint ownership means in terms of who has what rights, who can do what, who's commercializing. All of these things should be clarified at the outset. Otherwise you're potentially just leaving a problem down the track. And being clear at the outset is also um, completely consistent with the Commonwealth objectives. Um, so I also mentioned that ownership could be split into different fields as well. Um, you might also consider protection responsibilities for the intellectual property. So if, if there's a, a partner who's volunteering to, to um, uh, pay for patent attorney expenses and uh, pay for protection of IP, and the, these things can be very expensive, um, then it may make sense for that, that party to have, have ownership rights. Um, it also may make sense to look at different models if, for example, um, the lead is, is very interested in a specific field, um, but the, the IP has much broader application in other fields, then, then you could also look to different models. Um, so in terms of protection, you can also look at um, clauses around consulting for um, obtaining patent rights. You can also look around licensing and field restrictions. So um, there's, there's the lead and there's generally another SME involved in the project. Uh, you may wish to consider what that other SME, what its interest is, whether it wants a license in a specific field or whether it um, um, whether it's simply involved for the good of the project, it, it depends on, the, depends on the, the interests of the parties. You could also, if desired, um, you could also in, insert a protect and use it or lose it model whereby a partner is obliged to, to pursue commercialization or the other parties might request either a license back or, or ownership. Now, those clauses can be and difficult to negotiate so just have a have a think about that one rights to returns um, commonly rights to returns from commercialization um, may be expected to, based on the contributions of the different partners the the guidelines and I've just pasted paragraph 61 from the guidelines kind of imply that the parties may expect a return based upon their their contribution so that's something to think about as well um, and rights to returns, you, there, there's different models that you could use there. You could simply have a to be negotiated reasonable returns clauses in the future, or you could be quite specific and break down um, how any income would be shared um, or any net profit, etc. cetera. So moving on, um, tip number 10 is what if something goes wrong? Um, so this is... Uh, you're in the project, you're halfway through and uh, you're about to miss a deliverable milestone to the Commonwealth. Um, the, the top tip here is to get onto it and get onto it early and ensure that it's addressed. Um, so ask yourself whether it can be fixed and if it can be fixed, then take prompt action to, to rectify it. Um, consider also the, the financial stick as to whether payments um, can or should be withheld until until delivery. 
um, and also ensure that you fulfil your reporting obligations to and seek approval from the Commonwealth early in relation to any changes. So the Commonwealth clauses are fairly robust in terms of the obligation of the, the lead to, to report any issues to the Commonwealth. Um, and the, the best position to be in is to, of course, to preempt any issues and to have replacement and termination clauses in place. Uh, there are a number of clauses within the, the template, um, uh, but you may wish to, to add to those and consider, consider when termination might apply or when you might want to remove a party and also consider whether it should be mutual. The clauses, as they are written at the moment, give the lead the right to terminate, but there's no um, mechanism in there, for example, for an SME to, to withdraw or for a university to withdraw if, if the lead isn't performing or if the lead hasn't made a payment when due. So those clauses could be um, mutualised further in, in that regard. I think we have a... I'll stop in a sec. So I think we have a number of questions, but I was just including a bonus tip here. It's always good, good to give people something that they can take away. Um, so this is really just a summary slide of um, a few things to think about. I'm, I'm not sure if I've captured everything from the presentation here, but um, this is really a present just summarising uh, clauses that are existing in the current template provided by the Commonwealth that you might want to um, think about adding some more to and um, so they're as listed and from there I've also added clauses that aren't in the template that you might want to think about adding and that will of course depend on the context of the specific project but um, we we have temp we, we have expanded on the template and included included all of those various items in there so um, great thanks Jason, um, it was a bit longer than I anticipated, so we'll have to get quick into questions. Sorry. Darren, uh, that's all right. Would you also add uh, defence controls to that list? Uh, yes, of course, yeah. Yeah. Because um, a lot of these, or a number of uh, these projects are operating in the defence space, but also people need to think about whether they their uh, IP may have... Um, you know, dual use. They may not be thinking about it as a defence thing, so um, think about it early. Darren from um, University of Tasmania has pointed out that it would be uh, useful in the Commonwealth guidelines uh, if it highlights the difficulties of jointly owned IP. We would agree with that. Uh, this is where we often do see and I'd agree with uh, Jason's comments that it tends to be the easy way out. It sounds fine when you're thinking about it, but it's much more difficult when it's um, actual um, IP there ready to be prosecuted and then uh, and then you're wishing that one one of the partners had control to, to uh, push on with it. Um, and uh, yes, uh, any returns need to be... Um, uh, taken into account after the cost of commercialisation. Uh, do we need to notify the Commonwealth if we decide to uh, subcontract, said somebody with a number? Uh, not necessarily. It really depends on um, pre presuming that uh, it's either fairly clear in the application itself or the... Um, or that the subcontracting activities aren't substantive, then generally you wouldn't need to notify. Um, but if, if they are more substantive, um, if, for example, a subcontractor, there might be some question as to whether they should actually be a partner within the project, then, then you would look to notify the Commonwealth at that stage. Um, you can't um, decide you know, once you're into the project that I oh, will just get a different partner to do this work because we can, we've found a way to do it, you know, 10% cheaper or something like that. Um, occasionally that happens uh, where people just decide, oh, somebody else could do it, where they may not have taken into account that the university's done an awful lot of work to get to the point where they uh, 
have defined it all and stuff like that. And we see occasionally people pick it up and ask somebody else to do it as a quote and get under underwritten. Any other questions? Uh, if you're speaking yet and you haven't taken yourself off mute, obviously we can't hear you. Otherwise, you might have clavered absolutely everything, Jason. I just bored everyone and they've all left. <laughs> There's still participants online, but there's no evidence to me that they're still awake. <laughs> <laughs> Darren, Darren and, uh, yeah, uh, and our oh. Breadmore is awake. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, can you go back? Uh, thanks for that, Jason. Um, can you go back to that slide where you're talking about the um, licensing to the Commonwealth or something? I think it's like three or four slides back. Uh, yep, report that. Um, board, probably about oh, yeah, I think it was that one. I think it was that, that one. one. Yeah. So, yeah, it was so just, just about will it be reported licensed to Commonwealth? Can you explain what that means again? Yeah, so the, the Commonwealth, as part of the grant agreement, the Commonwealth receives a license to any material that's reported to it. So, commonly, most commonly, that's the uh, reports that you will automatically, well, regularly generate to the Commonwealth as part of delivering on the milestones, that doesn't automatically include any intellectual property generated in the project. So if, for example, a new invention, a patentable invention is required, then um, created, then you might report to the Commonwealth that it's been created, but you wouldn't necessarily report the full details of that invention. If, if you report the full details, they're going to receive a license to it. But if you hold that, which is the norm, um, then then they won't receive a license to it. So, so it's only triggered really when it's actually reported or reportable to the Commonwealth. Um, and the reports are fairly standard templates, so I don't see any particular issues there. Um, but so, Jason, does that mean the the Commonwealth wants the license so that it's free to use the reports when it gets them? Correct. Uh, and, but they're not expecting you to give all the details of every experiment in, in ad nauseum. The data, yeah, no. And people need to be aware of that, that if you do report it all, the Commonwealth has a licence. It doesn't mean they'll do anything with it. Um, but no, it's definitely not. But it's, it's one of these tricks you need to be aware of right at the start. The, it's helpful to point out that the, the grant agreement has uh, Clause 17 addresses the, the Commonwealth's rights um, and the, their rights in Clause 17.2 are quite, quite broad, that they have a permanent non-revocable, irrevocable licence to use the reporting material for, for Commonwealth purposes. Um, but Clause 17.3 says that um, that licence doesn't apply to activity materials. So, that's anything else created in the project which isn't reported to the Commonwealth. So, and, and that's why it's, it's helpful for every partner to be across what is being reported to the Commonwealth because um, you don't want one partner thinking that something's particularly valuable and then, then like the data and outcomes of the project and then finding out that all of it's been reported to the Commonwealth and is subject to a license that they might want to, might need to declare down the track if um, someone's looking to invest in them and they need to um, answer due diligence questions. Because we always, we use the term Commonwealth, but uh, it's administered through the Department of Industry and by people in the department, and they're really good people. So you should, uh, shouldn't hesitate to contact them uh, in the lead up to applying for a CRCP if you need to clarify anything, uh, they are available. I think about 5% of applications go in as non-compliant. And so obviously a phone call or an email could have uh, avoided that situation. I hate to think that people go to all that work. Um, so uh, it's Martin Dent uh, manages the CRCPs. Uh, Harvey Perkins is actually online, been listening. He's in that team. Um, but there are people that are um, very friendly and very helpful at the Commonwealth. They won't write your application for you. Um, we've tried that in the past, but they uh, uh, they will give you a lot of information. So if in doubt, I always recommend people get on to the Commonwealth in the first instance, especially if it's about uh, a doubt about a guideline or how, how to address something in the applications. Uh, 
uh, they're a resource to be used. They're not just gatekeepers, you know, saying yes or no over your project. Should also be mentioned that uh, Tony Peacock from the CRC Association knows a fair, fair thing or two about uh, CRC fees. Yeah. Um, so if there's no more questions, I'm going to thank uh, Jason, thank Elementary Law. It was comprehensive. Uh, all these slides will be made available uh, to you all. Um, as I said, use the department. If you're contemplating a CRC bid, we'd welcome you as a CRC association member. We're, we're not government, we're uh, um, membership based and uh, we will be offering a package with uh, elementary law to uh, give you access to uh, the more detailed uh, information and his template. We, we're always keen to cut the costs of uh, your work in bidding. Uh, Collaborate Innovate 2019 is our conference. It'll be held in Adelaide 28th to the 30th of May this year. And if you thought today was useful, uh, this is only a taste. Uh, you can come for the two and a half days of tips. We don't allow Jason to speak for two and a half days. Um, and I'll just leave that comment there. The business research matchup uh, is included in that. And if you're unaware of what it is, go to our um, uh, go to our uh, website and uh, look at that because it's a fantastic way to meet new collaborators. Um, we're really pleased. This will be the fourth time we've run it and there's been uh, uh, really fantastic um, results uh, from that today. So uh, we'll finish up now. we just one minute over uh, and uh, thank you all for participating. Jordan's going to... Oh, somebody's asked uh, Jason's fee. We'll leave that private, I think. Uh, you can. <laughs> um, he's reasonable. We're, we're always happy to um, to help people out as they submit and uh, to have off off the record phone calls and um, just to um, provide assistance through the process and then to um, look at doing a set fee model around um, around actual success. So great, yeah. thank you. Great. All right. Well, thanks, uh, everyone, and we'll shut uh, shut it down for now. And the, both the presentation, uh, in case you want to listen to uh, Jason again, um, there, the, uh, give his uh, thirty minute talk, <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, the slides will be made available. So, thanks for your participation today. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.